Hi, everybody. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, wherever you are, I'd like to welcome you all to this uh, IHCH uh, uh, Journal Club by the uh, International Academy for Clinical Hematology. Uh, I'm Mohamed Moti from the Sorbonne University and Saint Antoine Hospital uh, in Paris, in France. And it is my great pleasure and honor to welcome uh, today for the purpose of this uh, journal club, uh, two famous panelists, Professor Jean-Luc Harousseau from the uh, Institut de Cancerologie de l'Ouest and the Nantes University Hospital in France, and Professor uh, Graham Jackson from uh, Newcastle, uh, who is, and this is extremely important for us today, the uh, coordinating investigator of the Maloma 11 UK uh, trial. And for the purpose of this journal club, we have uh, uh, chosen, we have chosen uh, an article in the British uh, Journal of uh, Hematology uh, from this Maloma 11 uh, trial. The uh, Journal Club of the IACH is supported by an unrestricted generous uh, educational grant from uh, Takeda uh, Oncology. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, this is the article that will be uh, discussed uh, uh, today. It has been published uh, very recently in the uh, British uh, Journal of uh, Hematology. And it is rather a very straightforward and very nice message where the investigators have looked in the transplant uh, population in the group of patients who received autologous stem cell transplantation while being treated in this, uh, multiple myelo in this myeloma uh, 11 trial. And they have uh, tried to assess the outcome of those patients with an early relapse. An early relapse has been defined as being a relapse within the 12 months after high dose uh, melphalan. And to make a long story short, uh, this analysis uh, allowed them in a rather very elegant fashion to identify a sort of a, a functional uh, group a sort of a, a high-risk multiple myeloma group defined uh, in a sort of a functional manner beside the usual, uh, I think, uh, high-risk criteria. And I'll be showing only a single uh, figure from uh, this article, but this is really uh, very meaningful. If you look to the overall survival of these two groups, it is really a big uh, difference, highly significant, highlighting that uh, these patients uh, who are relapsing very early after transplant are actually uh, patients who will have a dismal outcome. And this is probably an unmet medical need. And this is what we uh, would like to uh, discuss with uh, our yes. panelists. So my first question will go to Professor uh, Harousseau, and you're not a co-author uh, of this work or of this study, but you have dedicated three or four decades of your career uh, to multiple myeloma with a special focus on uh, transplantation. What was your first reaction uh, when seeing these results, Professor Harusto. Uh, first, uh, thank you, Mohammed, for inviting me to participate in this meeting. And second, mm -hmm. let me thank you for recalling that I'm already getting old with uh, three or four decades of experience. <laughs> well, um, the first world is, of course, a paper coming from the MRC especially the MRC Myeloma 11 trial, which was a, a very uh, well-designed uh, study on a large number of patients. And the, the myeloma uh, trials are always performed on a very large number of patients, uh, provide us with very serious data. And, and the, the first comment is that 
when somebody is written by the MRC, we have to trust them. Second uh, comment is that what they really show is that patients relapsing early after transplant have a dismal prognosis. And they prove that. I would say that not a surprise and we have many examples in the hematology where the patients who relapse early after transplant have a very poor prognosis. And even in multiple myeloma, Bald Biology already showed in 2008 that a patient who achieved complete response but to relapse, and at that time it was less than three years after CR achievement, had a very poor prognosis. So I would agree that relapsing early after transplant is a very poor prognostic indicator. My third comment is um, that uh, the importance of this paper is to try and find which patient will relapse early in order to treat them differently and to have a, a tailored treatment giving the best treatment or the most uh, aggressive treatment if it's needed to the patients who, for whom we know that they will relapse early and they will have a dismal prognosis. And I think that that is a key question and that is exactly what we have to discuss today. How can we define those patients who will relapse 12 months after transplants? Uh, should we treat them differently our new, newer treatment, because MRC11 was already with new treatments, but newer treatment, for instance, quadruple combination, would this treatment would be more effective in patients for whom we think that the prognosis would be dismal because of early relapse. So that are the briefly the three comments I wanted to make. Thank you very much. That's really very clear. So Graham, uh, my question to you is, what was the rationale behind doing this work? And why did you choose 12 months and not six months or 18 months or even two years? Because today, when we look to the uh, projected, I would say median PFS or median survival of a transplant eligible patient using all the novel inductions, transplant consolidation and maintenance, what would one would guess that even two years that's relatively short so uh, how did you uh, design this analysis it's a it's a really good question Mohammed. We, we we really wanted to look at what how we could define this high risk group of patients as you really nicely pointed out in your introduction early relapses do very badly and as you know, we have a lot more tools in terms of our induction therapies, um, but they are expensive. We talk about four drug regimes, tandem transplants, consolidation, continued maintenance. Uh, and maybe one of the, the feelings that we all have is that we should really be concentrating a lot of those tools on the higher risk patients. And then maybe the standard risk patients don't need as much of those extensive and, uh, and prolonged therapies. So we wanted to look at, can we really define high risk? Now, I accept that things have changed and, and we've seen from, the, um, from Professor Carvo that double transplants work for high risk patients. So it was just a look and, and we did find some interesting things. So, for instance, 28% of the patients who relapsed early had standard risk cytogenetics and 22% of the patients had stage one disease. I think what really comes out in terms of the cytogenetics is that it's the double hit patients that really do the worst. And if you look at the early relapses, 36% double hit disease versus 9% in the patients who relapsed beyond one year. Now, I, I accept the 12 month cut, cut off was uh, arbitrary, and we've seen CIBMTR data from Shaji Kumar looking at a two year cut off, uh, but again, showing very, very similar data. We've seen data from Kui Young looking at the same thing. These early relapses 
are really going to have a poor prognosis. Now, I also accept that this will change, that the people relapsing off of four drug regimes, such as the 40 study, they're not going to be so many. But I think we need to keep looking at these early relapses because this is an area where novel therapies could be introduced earlier. Thank you, Graham. So Jean-Luc, you alluded that uh, one of the major perspective of this paper is about finding or designing new treatment approaches for these high-risk patients. Uh, however, uh, well, uh, this is actually the reality of being live, guys. So we're not editing anything. And My daughter. <laughs> absolutely. And I say hello to uh, the whole Haruso family. So this is the uh, beauty about being live, you know. Uh, uh, they are very uh, interested in myeloma, actually. <laughs> of course, of course, of course. Uh, so uh, my question is about, uh, given the dynamic of uh, uh, and the advent of many novel therapies, uh, do you think that these conclusions from this paper uh, would be relevant today if patients had access to uh, other treatments, other drugs. I mean, if I look into this paper in, in details, uh, some of the inductions were CTD, which we know is suboptimal. Uh, when I read carefully, uh, Graham, and I read this paper very carefully, uh, patients in the early relapse group were less likely to have received lenalidomide-based maintenance. So definitely they haven't been like optimally treated. So what are your thoughts, Jean-Luc? Well, I think that uh, it's a very important point. Uh, obviously, uh, we have more and more active agents and we already know that, for instance, adding an anti-CD38 antibody like daratumumab or isatuximab uh, will certainly improve the response rates, but more than that, the minimal residual disease negativity proportion, and probably, although it's too early to be very uh, optimistic, but we are optimistic, probably progression tree survival and overall survival, also overall survival is already very long in the majority of patients. The question is, like Graham correctly uh, said, do all patients need these new agents? And another question is, in very high risk patients, do these new treatments are as active as for the rest of the patient? And we have some indication that even the ratumumab, let's say for instance, in the Alcyon trial in elderly patient, there are two of it is not that active uh, and, and does not improve the prognosis of uh, high risk cytogenetic patients. So there are two questions. Do all patients need four drug combination, double transplantation? Certainly not. Uh, or at least if we change the objective and want to cure them, then they need this best treatment. But second question, is it, will it be active for all these patients? But there is also, I think, a, a more important question is how do we define those patients with a poor risk disease, those patients who will relapse very rapidly and will have a very short progression for survival. So those patients for whom we, we need to try something else. And I think that uh, uh, what was very important in, in uh, Graham's statement is that not all patients were with poor cytogenetics or with uh, stage three disease. So for me, the important question is how do we define poor risk disease? We have, of course, many, uh, uh, criteria, and especially cytogenetic criteria, but then they are discussed. Translocation 414 is not considered as high risk as deletion 17P. And 
Graham said that double heat is suddenly the most important prognostic factor. But translocation 1416 is debated as well. So, and, and I finish here, maybe the best way to define those patients who will relapse early and will have a dismal prognosis is not to look at the initial characteristics because some with good characteristics may have a dismal prognosis while some with poor characteristics may have a long progression free survival. That's the reason why in our group, we have decided a, a completely different approach, which is to look at the response to initial treatments and to consider that a patient who does not achieve a minimal residual disease at, at least 10 to the minus five after a good induction treatment is at high risk. And for this patient, we should do more. So th this is very uh, important. And by the way, I would like to mention that translocation 1416 wasn't part of the high risk group in uh, this paper. So here we have a question from Professor Meral Beksak in Turkey. And I say hello to Meral. Uh, uh, she wrote that CIBMTR and GMIMA uh, have attempted to develop scoring models to predict early relapse. And actually in line what you said, Jean-Luc, the first CIBMTR, but not the GMMA one, have noticed improvement by including the pre-auto transplant response. Obviously it's the way you assess the response. So my question to you, Graham, how did you try to uh, validate or to test uh, these kind of scoring to develop these scoring system based on your current data? So I, I, I would uh, firstly completely concur with Jean-Luc that in terms of assessing high risk, we have to use all the tools at our disposal, including that dynamic assessment of response and looking at MRD negativity as, as a response assessment. And, and I would just, uh, in response to Professor Bursic's question, just say that Francesca Gay has got a paper uh, in press uh, looking at a dynamic response assessment. So she looks at high risk in terms of 414, LDH, 17P, plasma cell load in the bone marrow, which is, a, which is another thing that we don't always think about. Uh, and land a light chain restriction. But she adds in a dynamic response with um, looking at people who achieve VGPR and adds that into the response assessment. And that really does help define a higher risk group of patients. And I'm sure as we get more and more papers with MRD negativity in it, that is also going to help us to define high risk. I would still say, nevertheless, that we there are a subgroup of patients which appear high risk, who achieve MRD negativity, who probably still relapse early and, and, and trying to get a different handle on that, whether we need to have imaging with MRI and PET, does extra medullary disease come into that high risk group of patients? Do we need to do gene expression profiling as well as cytogenetics and FISH? Um, and do we need to look at other things such as clonal hematopoiesis and, and the genetics of the disease more closely, you know, TP53 mutations or uh, double hit on the 17P? And the French have led the way on, on the level of 17P deletion as a risk factor as well. So there is a, a lot of things. I think that the one thing we can be sure of, Mohammed, is it's going to get more complicated rather than simpler. <laughs> So here we have a few questions from our audience and please do not hesitate to post your questions and send your comments. I'll do my best to share them with the panelists. Uh, so uh, the uh, question, uh, the comments from the audience I have is that uh, the uh, difference in survival is really convincing. So I think people are quite convinced about the strengths of this analysis. Uh, however, uh, 70% of these patients would have been predicted by simply the cytogenetic risk factor. So the uh, very striking group is the 30% group who didn't have, in theory, any risk factor at baseline. However, among the comments I'm receiving from the audience is that 
did you perform PET scan to everybody to detect extramedullary disease? Because maybe these patients who have small extramedullary disease. So this is uh, one aspect. What about circulating plasma cells? Uh, can we use this uh, as a predictor uh, of uh, high-risk disease? Because obviously the results are convincing and I'm reading here, but you can't guess this until you know, the patient relapse. So we want a sort of a, uh, a priori. So uh, Jean-Luc, would you agree with this comment? And then I'll, I'll give it back yeah, to Grant. I think that again, we have two possibilities, either defining the prognosis initially or defining the prognosis just after induction treatment or both. But a key question is how to define the initial prognosis. And I think that the, it's really an urgent need to have a consensus regarding cytogenetics because we still have in the majority of papers, three cytogenetic abnormality, translocation 414, deletion 17P and translocation 1416. As I said previously, translocation 414 has not the same prognostic impact as deletion 17P and translocation 1416 is debated because it's a rare. But on the contrary, we don't have usually the chromosome one abnormalities uh, the uh, 1P deletion and 1Q amplification, which are very important. And our group with uh, Hervé Aveloiseau showed that there are also uh, cytogenetic abnormalities that are associated with a better prognosis. So as you probably know, he designed a new score, which is probably more adapted especially more adapted to new treatments because it's in relation with the, the, the IFM 2009 trial, which is, uh, uh, I would say, one of the best trial with the use of uh, Revlimid, Bortezomib, and transplantation. So I think that we really have to discuss all together to, to Im improve the cytogenetic classification. Having said that, I do agree that the uh, detection of uh, extramedullary disease by an initial PET scan would be important. And there are probably other factors that we, we don't know, but start by, the, by having a consensus regarding what we know, and maybe the IMWG should uh, change the current uh, classification. Excellent, thank you. Uh, so I, I think we, we have here a comment from Dr. Dubashi, which is in line with this, for instance, about PET scan, and he, he or she is highlighting the issue of confirmed plasmocytoma. Uh, how, how was this handled in the myeloma 11 trial, Graham? Okay, so uh, as you know, Mohamed, the myeloma 11 trial is, is quite old now, so we didn't have PET CT scanning, so uh, I... I I don't have that data. And obviously you're a huge fan of the Casio PET study led by Philippe Moreau, which has really led the way on showing this. And I think we have to remember, we've only had that sort of imaging really available mainstream in myeloma for four or five years. So I don't have that information, but I'm sure that extramedullary and paramedullary disease are very important. And I think Philippe's study has really been important in showing that. I'd also agree with Jean-Luc that the French Cytogenetic Prognostic Index, which uh, I think is a really fantastic attempt to, to update how we assess cytogenetic risk. And I, I feel that that is the way forward. It includes a lot of other translocations that the RISS score doesn't do. Likewise, I think circulating plasma cells, very important. Uh, and that's a key issue that we didn't have that data but uh, we know that plasma cell leukemia is the extreme end of that scale. And certainly that's a part of our disease spectrum that has a porous prognosis. Thank you, Graham. And I think what you're alluding to, just for our audience to clarify the French scores, this is a work by Dr. Kaur and colleagues 
from the group of uh, Hervé Avelloiseau. So I think uh, Jean-Luc, you alluded to the dynamic assessment, uh, namely uh, measurable residual disease or minimal residual disease. And actually uh, uh, it is very interesting to link this to the recent Spanish paper published in Blood where they have shown that maybe MRD negativity uh, can overcome or uh, can bypass this high-risk uh, uh, patient. But at the same time, the high-risk patient are the ones where the probability of having MRD negativity is the lowest. So, so how, how would you uh, today integrate uh, uh, MRD? Uh, you know, what would be your ideal combination uh, between baseline and the dynamic evaluation to detect or predict these patients and then elaborate different uh, treatments uh, protocols? Well, f first, I have to confirm that uh, currently MRD assessment is a very important tool and probably achieving MRD negativity is a new objective of uh, myeloma treatment. So uh, having said that, uh, we agree that uh, patient achieving a high level of MRD negativity, at least 10 to the minus five and maybe 10 to the minus six, which is the requested level for, from our friend uh, Hervé Avilois. Also, those patients achieving a, a deep response, they, in the majority of cases, of course, it's statistical. In the majority of cases, they have a good outcome with a long progression-free survival. And what is true is that it doesn't depend on the initial characteristics, on the age of the patient, on the cytogenetics, and on the type of treatment. I mean that uh, the patients uh, who achieve MRD negativity, whatever treatment you received, may have the same good prognosis. However, you made a very good point. Patients with poor risk disease, poor risk cytogenetics, have less minimal residual negativity than patients with standard risk. The probability of achieving MRD negativity in high risk cytogenetic patients is much lower. So the initial characteristics remain very important. Why did we choose to focus on the uh, dynamic assessment of MRD negativity? For two reasons. First, we are not sure that uh, what is iris cytogenetic in France is the same as iris cytogenetic in England, is it the same as iris cytogenetic in the United States. So the, the second reason was that Again, a patient with deletion 17P, if he achieved 10 to the minus five minimal residual disease, may have a chance of long progression-free survival. So we thought it was more effective to look at the result of treatment, whatever the initial characteristics and to continue the same treatment, the standard treatment with one transplant or even no transplant in patients who achieved already MRD negativity after induction treatment, followed by maintenance. And for those patients who don't achieve MRD negativity, try new drugs, try double transplant. And Graham said that Michele Cavo showed that double transplant is better for poor research genetics. Yes, but it is in a given trial with a suboptimal induction treatment. So with newer induction, better induction, we still don't know. So it's a question to address for the future. A patient who has good risk don't need, doesn't need double transplant, but a patient who has poor risk, maybe he needs, but especially if he doesn't achieve, he doesn't achieve MRD negativity after induction treatment. So very simply, there are two possibilities, assessing the prognosis initially and treat patient with poor risk cytogenetic differently or poor risk disease differently, or give them a good in induction treatment, look at minimum residual disease negativity after the induction treatment and treat them differently according 
to the uh, response to the MRD assessment uh, results. So looking into treatment, we have several questions. So I'll try to summarize them. Uh, it looks like that in the myeloma 11, at least for this uh, uh, subgroup of early relapse, maintenance didn't make a difference actually. Uh, probably uh, highlighting that maintenance is probably needed over the long term, which is the philosophy of a maintenance therapy. And this is where maybe the concept of strong consolidation, whether it is an autotransplant, whether it's a CAR T cell, whether it's whatever, you know, combination that can be useful. What, what's your reaction to this, Graham? Okay, I, I think it's a, it's a really important point. And, and obviously, fewer, some patients don't get to maintenance. We have to look at that group of patients. But I think you do have to have a response-adapted approach. And if you look at the Forte study, the maintenance data that we saw at, at ASH showed that carfilzomib revlimid continuous therapy does better than revlimid alone, particularly for the higher-risk group of patients. So we're starting to see that. So I think there is this feeling that you need to keep the pressure on, drive the patients to MRD negativity, as Jean-Luc has said, and then adapt your strategies accordingly. And, and we've got a trial that's just opened in the UK for a for uh, transplant eligible population that literally does look at assessing patients on MRD negativity. Uh, but we are taking off the high-risk patients into a different study. So I think you have to look at all ways of trying to drive that best possible response, even in the high risk group of patients. And, and another thought is that we have to continue to look at the patients who don't do very well with the new agents. And really, all of our efforts, whether it's a, a pharmaceutical study or, a, or a, an academic study, I think what I would say from my data tonight is that we just have to keep looking at why patients still do badly as we get better and better therapy. So here we have a question for you, Jean-Luc, and this is from Dr. Thomas. I don't know if Thomas is a first name or last name, but I, this is the only uh, indication I have on the screen, is that you highlighted the value of MRD negativity. But at the same time, uh, most myeloma experts have been emphasizing the issue of sustained MRD negativity. So how are you going to evaluate sustained MRD negativity if you're looking only in a very limited time frame, uh, namely induction? How would you, ha would you reconcile these two parameters? Well, uh, it, it's, it's actually very easy. Um, I said that uh, MRD assessment will be a tool for treatment decision. But of course, we will continue to evaluate MRD in all patients, the good patients who already achieve MRD negativity at the level of 10 to the minus five. And our objective would be to further improve the results and to further deepen the response and to achieve 10 to the minus six. So we will have sequential MRD assessment. And of course, our objective is to reach MRD 10 to the minus six and to maintain patients with MRD negativity at the level of 10 to the minus six. And we, of course, will use maintenance treatment for those so they have a good patient. The same is true for the high risk patient who don't achieve 10 to the minus five. We will try something different. And you, you're right when you are saying that autologous transplantation is not the only way. We have all other possibilities, uh, for instance, with the CAR T cells or the new anti anti antibodies. Uh, so I think that the, uh, the problem is to find new treatment for those patients. But again, we will continue in case we achieve finally in those patients a good level of MRD negativity. We will continue. And I, I, I certainly agree that uh, it's not the objective is not to reach MRD negativity. It's to reach MRD negativity and to maintain MRD negativity with the prolonged treatment. The only way to cure patients is to have sustained MRD negativity. 
Absolutely. Uh, Graham, we have a question, I think, from South America, Dr. Jorge Garcia, asking you whether these results uh, can are relevant in the elderly population. In another word, if we start treatment of an elderly patient and this patient uh, has disease progression after one year of therapy, uh, uh, how, how would you design, you know, uh, sort of an elderly-like similar study? Okay, so that's, that's a really good question. I think we do know that cytogenetics still play a part in the elderly and frail population, but a data from our elderly study would say that as patients get older, there are other factors that become as important. Stage is still very important, and whatever else we say, beta 2 microglobulin still seems to be very important in our assessments. But then as we get into the older population, as you know, frailty and comorbidities become almost as important as cytogenetics, treatment tolerability, deliverability, side effects of the therapy. So I think the elderly population and high risk, certainly cytogenetics is important in the fitter elderly, but once you get into the frailer elderly, there are many other factors that come into play. And as you know, Gordon and I have a study uh, just looking at that frailty issue for our older patients. Jean-Luc, how would you handle uh, this uh, issue on trying? Uh, let, let's focus. I mean, I, I, I really appreciate uh, Graham and, of course, you know, the 85-year-old uh, patient who is frail and several comorbidities. Actually, it's going to be a multifactorial. But assuming we have the uh, 71-year-old patient who is fit. Good age. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, re receiving the, uh, what we would consider today in many places, the good standard, gold standard of care, uh, like in the Maya trial with daratumumab, lenalidomide, dexamethasone. How are we going to uh, predict or to try to identify uh, those patients uh, who are really high risk in this group besides cytogenetics? Um, that's a terrific question because uh, patients who are included into clinical trials are selected and they don't have the standard patients. So yes, the Maya trial is probably the best treatment to be given to an elderly population, but not to an elderly and frail population, to a selected elderly population. So if we consider the patient, the 71 year old patient, able to tolerate a long-term treatment with a IV or sub-Q injection of the ratumumab, which is rather well tolerated, but also with a long-term revlimin, then of course we give what we consider the best current treatment knowing that some patients with high-risk cytogenity don't do so well with the Maya uh, protocol. But for the rest, I think that uh, the question should be addressed. Maybe it's easier to, tra to treat an, a more frail patient with a gentle regimen, and of course, less expensive regimen, um, taking care of a quality of life and saving MRD, uh, saving, sorry, daratumumab and other drugs for the treatment of relapse. Or actually, if we don't know whether it's the best solution, we should look at how to better sequence treatment in those uh, groups of patients who are not the selected population treated in the clinical trials. Wonderful, thank you very much. We still have a lot to do. We're reaching the end of this uh, uh, journal club. Graham, uh, what, what's, what's next? Uh, I think well, you, you've done a wonderful Myeloma 11 uh, trial. Uh, I mean, the knowledge you have been able to generate is amazing. Uh, and you keep on doing these lovely analysis that are guiding, I think, our understanding and will help design the future tr protocol. So what's next after this paper? Uh, well, I, 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 I would firstly agree with Jean-Luc that I, I would go to Thierry and say with his Maya study, 
what about the patients who've relapsed on that excellent regime and, and have a look at those and see why are they different? I think I also might, we might go back and have a look at the early relapses in the elderly part of myeloma 11. And we could have this discussion again next year, maybe. Uh, so I will definitely do that. But I, I, I think that we, we need as a community to better define high risk. And of course, in a way that Jean-Luc said about dynamic assessment of response is important, we need to recognize that high risk will change as our regimes and induction therapies and salvage therapies change too. So we have to keep looking at these patients that do badly and work out why. Jean-Luc, one last word. Yeah, everything has been brilliantly explained by Graham and by you. Okay, well, thank you very much. It has been really a, a true pleasure to uh, spend uh, uh, these 40 minutes together. Uh, again, uh, congratulations, Graham, and uh, the whole uh, team of the Maloma 11 uh, uh, protocol from the UK. We're very grateful. Thanks to everybody involved in uh, research and in clinical trials to try to improve the uh, outcome of multiple myeloma patients. Thanks to all of you uh, watching uh, this uh, uh, journal uh, club uh, every 15 days. Uh, uh, we uh, really uh, enjoy having you with us. And as usual, wherever you are, I wish you a good evening, a good afternoon, a good morning, a good day, a good week. And uh, please stay safe and keep well. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.